Greetings, cultivators worldwide. Jordan River here, back at you with some more Growcast. Got some plants and a microphone, and I intend to use them. Today, we've got a great new guest for you. You're going to love Tim from Cultured Biologics. This is a fantastic episode. First, though, before we get into it, Oklahoma meetup going down in just a few short days. That's right. This Friday, as you're hearing this, this Friday, the 21st, we are in Oklahoma City. We are at Gaiate's Restaurant. That's G-U-Y-U-T-E-S. Uh, it's up on 23rd Street. Give it a Google. Come on down. We're there, like I said, Friday the 21st, 4.20 p.m. to 7.20 p.m. It is a public meetup. Come on down if you love the show. Say you're here for the uh, Growcast meetup. Come on up to the upper floor. There's a patio. There's consumption. There's seed swapping. There's food, delicious food, all at Gaiate's. Friday the 21st. 4.20 p.m. to 7.20 p.m. in Oklahoma City. Come on down. We'd love to see you. Steve Raisner is going to come out. Brandon Russ is going to come out. It's going to be a really good time. So pop on by sometime during that uh, that time frame, and we'll smoke one together. I would love to see you down there. That is, again, this Friday, the 21st, 4.20 to 7.20. Okay, for all of our action, go to growcastpodcast.com slash action. That's where you see everything. You can get on the green list there so you don't miss any travel dates or anything like that. Like I said, a banger of an episode today. I know you're going to enjoy Tim. Before that, though, Rimrock Analytical, we're going to give some love to my favorite sex testing partner, RimrockAnalytical.com. Stop wasting times. S- stop wasting time sex testing your regular genetics. Now, feminized is nice, but you're limiting your selection there. Not every strain is available in a nice, stable, feminized form. So you grab regs, but you don't want to sex out those males. Just go to rimrockanalytical.com, get some sex tests, use code GROWCAST for free shipping always, and then you can cull your males at the seedling stage. No wasting space, soil, nutrients, or nothing. Just snip a little cotyledon, mail it off to Rimrock. They are super super fast. I've seen people get results back on a Sunday, get results back in 24 hours, things of this nature, all at rimrockanalytical.com, code GROWCAST. And of course, they have plant tissue testing, soil testing, and so much more, all at rimrockanalytical.com, all code GROWCAST. All right, everyone, let's get into it with our brand new guest. You know we're going to have him back on again. Enjoy Tim from Cultured Biologics. Thank you for listening, and enjoy this program. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in again today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you share the show. Tell a grower about Growcast. Follow our new Instagram, at Growcast Live. The old one got taken down. And, uh, of course, be sure to get on the green list. Totally free. Growcastpodcast.com slash list. Get on there, and you'll stay up to date on everything Growcast. So you don't have the tech overlords protecting your sensitive eyes. Today we have a brand new guest. We are here in Grow Gear January. We are talking about nutrition today, nutrient lines, organic nutrition versus synthetic delivery. We're talking about regenerative agriculture, so much more, and we have the perfect guest for it. Today we have Tim from Cultured Biologics on the line. What's up, Tim? How you doing, Jordan? Doing good, man. How about yourself? Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, of course. I'm doing great. We started this new year and you know, have some really cool technology we're, we're getting out to the public. So just, you know, trying to talk about it, just kind of educate people as we go and really bring something new to the market. Cultured biologics, really interesting line. Um, a lot of people using it. I'm sorry, do I have that right? Biologics, that's with an X? Yes, with an X. Now you can find it's, it at culturedbiologics.com. Everybody, I want to make sure I get the correct URL out there. We have uh, listeners using your product. We have members using your product. Uh, Stoner Steven, shout out to Stoner Steven. I think the Grow Lab on Instagram. Oh, yeah. Uh, really yes. talented cultivator. Oh, my God. I'm sure he's been tagging you guys. Um, he grows, yeah. he grows yeah. a lot of Seed Co. strains. And, man, he just does such a good job with your line. There's a lot of great options out there, but we like what you're doing because it's organic leaning. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk today about not just the nutrient line itself, but everything that you believe in and all of your expertise that that comes sure. finds its way into the cannabis fertilization world. It's it's very interesting to us growers, man. Yeah. So why don't we start with uh why don't we start though with the story of cultured, how you came to cultured biologics and what your mission is? Sure. So I guess I can start with like my background. Uh I originally come from uh the pharmaceutical world. Uh compound pharmacy is, is my emphasis where I went to school for. You know, it's a synthesis of of medicines and you know, kind of got down that road and wasn't too thrilled with kind of where our pharmaceutical industry was 
was going at the time. It's very much of a isolation synthesis chemistry, you know, pill for a pill type of thing. And I, that's not where I wanted to be. I wanted to be making actual, actual medicine. So got out and got into the agrochemical world. So originally I didn't even start in the cannabis industry. I started in agriculture and started working with um, an advanced laboratory out of South Korea using uh, or making advanced biochemical um, organic products, you know, very different than our conventional products and got mm-hmm. to work with the um, United Nations on regenerative farming and using these advanced organics to, to revolutionize how we, how we farm. We've been doing things for the same way for so long. Mm-hmm. Since the fifties and the green revolution and taking all our leftover munition supplies, the ammonium nitrate and all that, and putting into fertilizer and telling everybody, this is the new way to grow. Where before we were, you know, taking organic byproducts like seaweed and manure and mixing that into our soil and making an ecosystem. Well, these these chemicals came out and just started ravaging our land. So my my whole emphasis has been kind of in regenerative farming and and um organic agriculture. So about we worked for uh, worked for a company about three or four years, learning conventional agriculture and how all of our technologies and everything that really goes into it. Mm-hmm. About five years ago, that's yeah, going on five years now. My best friends and I opened up Culture Biologics. We just wanted to make our own products and and really get this new technology out there and and not be held back by any type of you know other type of restrictions or any you know, anyone else's. Um, perspectives, I guess, Mm -hmm. you know, so we opened up culture biologics to just bring new revolutionary organic technology to our industry that really hasn't seen any type of revolutionary progress since the green revolution, you know? Right. So I would love to dive right into that and speak to that. I have so many questions. Sure. (laughs) Feel free. First thing though, like you said, the, the, the kind of global perception of agriculture in general and working with the United Mm -hmm. Nations, Now, the whole conspiracy, uh, I don't even want to say theory, it's just the kind of conspiracy, the big ag conspiracy is kind of getting farmers around the world hooked on these synthetics, and a lot of people say it's malicious and it's all this. When you speak to people or work with people at the UN, what is your take on that? Are they genuinely surprised when they learn about things like microbiology and, and regenerative agriculture? Are they generally receptive? Are they generally not? What was your kind of... What was your take on that? Well, I, you know, we have so many brilliant people really working on, on how to feed the world, how to provide a ecosystem that actually allows for a reduction of healthcare costs. You know, there's a, a bunch of aspects that go into it outside of just the people are trying to kill us. Where, you know, (laughs) the trends and forces, I totally agree with what you're saying. You're talking about a trends and forces theory of history, which is much more complex. Exactly. And so the main perspective, so I I give you my take. So when I got involved, there was a lot of interaction with the European Commission, the European Union and the Asian countries. And they're all trying to figure out how do we reduce our cost of healthcare? And so, you know, to give you a perspective where, where a lot of these brilliant people's minds are focused. They had summits. They have a summit every year, and they they're constantly trying to figure out how do we reduce the impact of healthcare on our on our society because the cost of all the the doctors, the cost of the technology, I mean everything that goes into it from hospitals being filled up, especially with what's going on right now. And this has gone over. This symposium has gone over a period of 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. So a lot of these people put their heads together and, and they like. How do you reduce the cost of healthcare on a society? Do you increase the access to medicine? Do you increase the amount of doctors? Do you increase the amount of hospitals? Do you increase the amount of post-hospital therapy and care? So there's all these different ways to look at it as what we can do to improve the the uh, weight on society when it comes to healthcare being completely filled up or healthcare being not able to have the amount of a proper impact it has on people's lives. So what I where I got involved, the long story short, is we came back to the core ideology that the, the food you put inside your body ultimately impacts the health of the human. And that ultimately impacts the health care. So no matter how many hospitals you go, no matter how many equipment you research and you fund, the core thing that we found in our research was that the health of the human, the food you put into your body, whether it's laced with pesticides or not, whether it's laced with glyphosate or not, whether it's 
chemically derived and it ha- doesn't have the proper alkaloids inside the, the fruit to give your body antioxidants. You know, that is the, that is the ultimate core factor. That's the foundation of, of reducing the impact of healthcare on a society. Wow. Man. So that's where I got involved with organic laboratory and making compounds that can fit our conventional equipment, but not be toxic to humans to actually build produce that is healthy for humans. Jeez, you are blowing my mind and you are speaking <laughs> my language all at the same time. From a chemist's perspective, with the background that you have, you know, I hear a lot of pushback on on uh, organic foodstuffs for the longest. I really think it's coming around now. I think for the longest time, people were like, this is a scam. There were a lot of companies that were just putting whatever labels they could and, and kind of were scamming. Mm-hmm. But you're, you're so right. When you take a look at the large scale uh, impacts of modern farming, it has reduced the quality of your foods. How would you define that from a chemist's perspective? I always thought it was just the microbiology. You mentioned alkaloids and antioxidants. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your take on that. Sure. Um, So, you know, when you use a lot of these synthetic conventional chemicals, you so we're going to look at it from a couple different perspectives, I guess. The first perspective is, let's look at it from a microorganism um, perspective. We're told in in conventional university and, and collegiate text that the plant requires 17 essential elements to live carbon (laughs) hydrogen oxygen are three elements that you don't have to provide because nature provides them readily now technically that is true what the to an extent what the plant takes up are those 17 elements right right co2 is everywhere carbon's in the soil but when you're putting heavy nitrate loads heavy chemical loads into the soil so mind you, the plant's still taking up carbon out of the soil, and carbon is the core catalyst to all life in the soil. We're all carbon-based organisms. So when the plant's leaching carbon out of the soil along with all these nitrates and along with all these phosphates and other, other elements, but you're not putting carbon back into the soil, the microorganisms can't have a carbon source to hold on to. So you're essentially strip mining the soil and reducing the, the, the amount of microorganisms in the soil. And these microorganisms are what we eat. They get on the fruit, they get on the plant, they, they're, they're we eat and they go into our gut and they, they increase our immunity. Mm-hmm. The other thing is when you use these conventional chemicals, like all these neurotoxins like imidacloprid or microbutanol, or you use herbicides like glyphosate, you're, you're killing, you're, you're, nu- you're, you're essentially eradicating all these positive microorganisms in the soil with all these insecticides and fungicides and bacterial sides. So now you're really not getting the microorganism complex and all these bad organisms now have the ability because there's no good ones in the soil to protect the plant. You have all these bad organisms coming in, mildew and gray mold that you are now consuming and your, your food just doesn't have a storage life. So there's there's part of this is like we're killing the, the biology in the soil by not putting carbon back into it and by using all these chemicals to grow our food. Wow. The second thing about this is, and this goes into the pure nutrition of it, when you are getting a heavy nitrate load and, you know, the sugars inside of a grape, they're carbon-based. The antioxidants in blueberries are carbon-based. The things that make a pepper spicy, the capsaicin is carbon-based. So all these caffeine inside of a coffee is carbon-based huh? so all of these <laughs> compounds that go into our our system are carbon-based but we're not feeding the plant any carbon so now the soil is deficient of carbon so it it doesn't have the precursors it needs to actually grow all the things inside the fruit that actually and the vegetables that actually give us these antioxidants that actually give us these 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 molecules these alkaloids that help us be healthy and have a good immune system Jeez, man, we need to connect. We were talking a little (laughs) bit off air, but my whole job over at the Coffee Health and Science podcast is figuring out, okay, I'm working with researchers now that are that are determining why is coffee good for you? It's it's an entourage effect. It's full of phytochemicals, things like chlorogenic acids that are antioxidants, things like trigonaline, malic acid, all these different things. We know that drinking a Red Bull doesn't have the same cancer prevention that coffee does. We're figuring out why is that? For right. you to tie it back and say, this is all carbon based. This is all carbon. And, yep. and we've had leaders in cannabis come on this show. People like Brandon Russ talk about the importance of carbon based fertilization. Mm-hmm. What does it mean for cannabis? Is it the same thing? Terpenes, yeah. cannabinoids, yep. everything. Yep. 
these are all molecules that require the plant just can't take from nothing and create these substances. So when we have all these molecules that are, are carbon-based, you have to have a carbon system. This is where me and the collegiate education and, and agriculture kind of split ways. You know, there's a lot of brilliant people, but through my decade of research, and this is based on my, my own research in agriculture and cannabis itself, um, as an organic chemist, is like I, everything's starting to be a carbon deficient. Our soil organic matter in our soil is being depleted. So we don't have these carbon sinks that we used to. Well, this is why this is why with my nutrient line uh, that we've been working on for the past few years, it's protein and carbon based. You know, everything is attached to either amino acids or, or humic acids, where when it goes into the soil, it doesn't just wash out. It actually provides the carbon back into the soil and replenishes the carbon content so your, so your soil organic matter can go up so the soil itself can retain microorganisms. So the soil itself can contain nutrients and not just wash out. Because the only reason why your minerals and your nutrients stay inside the soil is because you have organic matter in there, and that's carbon. So, you know, in, in terms of, of cannabinoid and turkey production, uh, because our line is carbon-based, we've been doing some research, and it's really cool against all these nitrate products. You know, you have nitrate-based fertilizers, and then you have carbon-based fertilizers. Nitrates build biomass. They grow leaves. They grow stalks. They grow big plants. But when it comes to terpene synthesis, when it comes to actual cannabinoid synthesis, there's no nitrates in those terpenes and cannabinoids. You know, they're sulfur and carbon-based. So you need to put those precursors into the soil if you want your plant to synthesize this top yes. output of terpenes and, and cannabinoids, you know? So we've been doing research and we're increasing uh, cannabinoid, not only content, but cannabinoid spectrum by 10 to 33% across the board compared to nitrate-based fertilizers. And we've been really fortunate to work with the works with a um, uh, facility out here in Colorado. I'm just going to pitch them real quick, Alpin Stash. Oh, please. They're one of the most boutique cultivation facilities here in Colorado. Oh, yeah? Um, Using cultured? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're fully cultured. We're trying to plan a trip out to Colorado and see, um, you know, mammoth microbes, and maybe we can hook oh, up yeah. with these guys and we can give them some exposure yeah, if they'll should. have us into to their space. Yeah. Danny, Danny, the owner of that place, is an amazing individual. He cured his brain tumors. My brother's his lead cultivator. He cured his bone cancer with cannabis. So it's, it's, it's a really cool story and seeing what they're doing, how they're organically minded and very, very, you know, craft minded. And they picked our nutrient, our organic nutrient line up and that's all they're running now. And they're, they're seeing terpene levels increase, the cannabinoid spectrum. They saw a go increase. Uh, one of their strains, Lemmy Winks, it's an in-house strain, went from 17% to 27% THC. Wow. From switching on, on our stuff. And on top of that, not only did they see a THC increase, they saw the spectrum of cannabinoids increase and start popping up from non-detected to like 0.3%, 0.2% of like CBGs, CBCs, THCVs, CBD. So all these micro cannabinoids that really go into be having a full spectrum product are starting to be triggered with car this carbon-based nutrient line that we would call Eon, the evolution of nutrients uh, fertilizer line that we have. And it, it's really cool seeing all these cannabinoids not only increase, but like the spectrum. So like when you talk about it being a medicine, and it being like having an entourage effect and having the full spectrum effect in the, in the body, you know, we need to be using a nutrient line that's custom tailored for carbon output for, for alkaloids to this in the plant. Wow. And to do that, we need to have a carbon-based input. Okay. You know? I, I need you to break this down for me, the lay person, real, real simple. Because here's how I understand uh -huh. it. You know, if you're a living soil guy, you tend to the soil, you tend to the life in the soil. That's where you're primarily getting your carbon. Mm -hmm. Maybe you supplement CO2 in your grow. What is it about your nutrient lines that makes it carbon based? So there's a couple of different sources. First off, we don't use any nitrates, urea, or ammonia. We use protein, amino, amino based, protein based nitrogen. And every amino acid has a carbon chain attached to it, has, a, has carbon attached to the nitrogen. So you have, I mean, you have 18, 21 different essential amino acids and they're all carbon based. So when we put this amino acid into our soil, the carbon bonds to the soil itself and holds on to the nitrogen so the nitrogen doesn't just run through your medium like nitrates do because they're extremely water soluble. Wow. So protein load is one of our one of our carbon sources. And our, our calcium is pre-bonded to amino acids. 
our magnesium is pre-bonded to amino acids, our phosphorus, our potassium. So all these are already pre-bonded to the amino acids. There, they're pre-bonded to carbon. The other thing is humic acids are one of the longest chains of carbon we have access to. Fulvic acids as well are all carbon sources. They're all carboxylic acids. Humic acids are a very long chain of carbon. And that's why they're so good at chelating and attaching themselves to other molecules is because they have a, a really strong negative charge once they go into water. And a lot of these metal ions have a positive charge. So as soon as these humic acids touch your zinc, your copper, your calcium, your magnesium, your potassium, it bonds and absorbs the, those metals as a part of the carbon ring. And then when a plant takes it up, it can split apart the metal, the calcium, from the humic acids, from the carbon ring, and then take that carbon and use it as a precursor for all the cannabinoids and all the terpene sensors. Hmm. So um, it, it's using it's using it, it's using humic acids, proteins, and um, just all like all these biological um, all these biological elements, you know, in every single piece of the line. So, are yes. are there amino acids in every piece of the line? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh -huh. you're feeding with amino any, any acids. Nitrogen, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Oh, in any any time you see nitrogen in our um in our products, it's all it's all amino nitrogen. Okay. And every product has a little bit of nitrogen in it, so it's all amino based. And my understanding is it's not the same as those nitrates because you won't experience nutrient burn the same way like you would. Is that yeah. true? No, it's all bio, it's all bioavailable. You know, nitrates have a are, you gotta look at the reason why um the salts burn is because they're very high in salinity index, right? And burning, nutrient burning, is just dehydration of the plant. When a plant takes up too many salts and not enough water, because it's all a ratio of oxygen, water to salt right. that the plant takes up, if you're imbalanced and you have more salts than you do water going into the plant, you're going to dehydrate the plant, and then that's where you see the tip burn, and that's where you see the plant start to have some necrotic edges. Wow. So it won't it won't burn like the nitrates or like the phosphates because there's there's there's, there's, there's no, no salt salinity. Content. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That makes perfect sense. Yep. All right. I'm going to give you the breakdown of where we are on the humic acid story. And then I want sure. you to tell me how it is in your estimation. We'll be right back with Tim. But before that plant revolution, everybody, the creators of the great white line of grow products. You've seen the great white myco. That's the granular myco, a wonderful choice. They've been doing it for a long time, man. Plant Success, the people behind Plant Success were the OGs in this Myco game. There's only a couple people that weren't going through them in, in the original uh, start of this whole thing. The distribution of Myco, baby. They're the OGs over at Plant Revolution. You can check out their Orca product, my favorite liquid mycorrhiza. I use Orca all the time. It's also got a couple strains of beneficial bacteria in there. It is super, super clean. DWC approved, one of the few microbials I'd be throwing in there. Unlike their Myco Chum, I might not use that in DWC, and that's because that stuff is full of delicious molasses. Uh, might not be suitable for that system, but god damn does my soil love it. Living soil will freak out over this Myco Chum. It's Chum for the Mycorrhiza. It is uh, exactly what your beneficial microbials need to feed on. And I'm telling you, no matter what microbials you're using, Throw in some Myco Chum, and you're going to see even better results. Stack these microbial products. Use as many as you can. King Crab, use the Orca, use the Myco Chum, in addition to what you're already using, and you will love it. PlantRevolution.com to find out more, but find them in your local store. Thank you to Plant Revolution. All right, let's get back to it with Tim. So here's, here's my evolution of humic acids. You know, this wonderful... A miracle input in your soil with the uh, chelation of the nutrients you want, locking out heavy metals that you don't want, supposedly all sorts of good stuff. Well, all the old heads on my show, all the old hippies say you want to get the seabed or lake bed derived stuff because the Leonardite is is no good. It's junk and it, it takes months to break down in the soil and all this stuff. And then you get some of these other newfangled cannabis growers going, no, that's not the case. That's the granular Leonardite, the Leonardite that takes the six months to break down. You can get some high quality, soluble uh, humic acid from Leonardite and, and you're fine. It's good to go. And then other people saying, yeah, but the seabed stuff is still the best because of the, you know, uh, you have to make sure you're getting uh, the right humic acid itself, regardless of what it's derived from. And then the seabed stuff has a more wide range of mi micronutrients. What do you think of the different sourcing? of humic acids and where do you land on this kind of Leonardite versus seabed derived debate? 
So I'm not a fan of hydroxide extracted anything. A lot of the times what you see with like seaweed is they take the seaweed and they extract it with potassium hydroxide. And we use hydroxides to um, break down the fiber of something so we can extract the essence out of it, right? Well, same thing with the anardite shale. Usually the, the rock is, is digested with uh, potassium hydroxide and you have a really large potassium charge on it. If you have a large potassium charge on it, I'm not a fan of the seaweed or the, or the humic acids that are derived from that. I prefer the, the, the sea or lake bed um, humic acids. One, they're more microbially active. It's really hard to get activity through microorganisms when there's that high charge of, um, of potassium hydroxide in there. So I, I like the cold, I like cold pressed. I like microbial active humic acids. And that's all we use. Uh, we don't use any chemical stripped uh, Leonardi. Um, I'm sure it can work. Not my favorite version though. I, I like, I, you know, humic acid isn't just like one thing. Humic acid is tens of different of, of, of variations of, of these carbon rings. So humic acids is, and that's why it's such hard to like quantify is because you, there's so many different versions of humic acid mm-hmm. that we don't, you know, Leonardo shale is only going to give you certain versions, the, the seabed and lake bed, having all those different types of crustacean and, and, and aquatic animals and, and plants being compressed and underneath the bed for millions of years is going to be a way, way better source and we have more variety of humic acids than, than shale Leonardo. Wow. And then that's kind of where I sit on it is I, I want, I want, the full spectrum of humic acids and fulvic acids, not just a, a chemically grabbed version, you know? Do you know if there are any other ways to process the shale or is that the only way that they make the stuff? That's, I mean, every other process is so laborious that, that that's our commercially viable way to do it. I'm sure there's other ways that people have, that the chemists have rendered it um, usable, which is not very prevalent. There is a shale version that isn't, digested in potassium hydroxide it's probably an okay source it's probably still not going to have as much variety as like a ancient seabed or something you know (laughs) oh the plot thickens this is a killer episode (laughs) man i know people are people are hitting the thumbs up button people are hitting subscribe i do appreciate that really cool stuff oh let me ask you this do you have a straight humic acid product or is there so much in your fertilizer that you don't have a humic bottle no, I don't. I don't have just a humic. I like to, I like to make composites. You know, you can probably find a straight humic acid from like Faust uh, Bio Egg, and he has one of the best humic acids in the world. Amazing researcher, amazing scientist. He's one of my um, agricultural idols, you could say. You know, it, I, I prefer to make composite products to make it a little bit easier, so you don't have to grab fourteen different products to do a function. You know. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, just for those who might have a um, have a setup already and want to try adding some of these humics into their garden. But you can find everything at culturedbiologics.com uh, for the listener. Yeah, and then that's why like, I, 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 so, our, so our nutrient line is composed of uh, four products mainly. It's a vegetative-based fertilizer. It's a blooming-based fertilizer. So it's true one-part fertilizer. It's a non-nitrate CalMag supplement, so an organic CalMag. And then a rock phosphate-based PK booster, so an organic PK booster. So what I wanted to do was, instead of grabbing a bottle of amino acids, a bottle of humic acids, a bottle of seaweed, you know, have all your different inputs, I, I made your, your base fertilizers have your all your macros, secondary micronutrients. It's got your humic acids, your amino acids, and your seaweed. So I wanted you to have, you know, five products in those one products that you use, and they're all powders. So it's just scooping in powder and putting it into water and you have a composite. Oh, of like, wow. It is powder. You know, your, I don't know why it was yeah. liquid in my mind. <laughs> no, no. And that's the other thing. I wanted to get away from water. And so you, we can have a little more efficiency with logistics and shipping places and reduce the cost per gallon. Cause I'm not selling water and not shipping water, you know? So I want to make this as, as organic, as affordable and as effective as possible. Man, really, really cool stuff. We have a partner, the Foop. Uh, they're actually certified oh, yeah. as a uh, as an organic fertilizer. Have you looked into that? I spoke with the guy from the Foop, a uh, really good friend of the show. Uh, we're we're down with anybody who's doing it. Sure, we're, do, we're doing it organic. But I'll tell you this: he said it was a bitch to to get the certifications, and they want all this stuff, and it's expensive, and they look at your oh, shit. Yeah. Is it is it really that bad? Oh, it's a pants down process, man. It's it's the that's why. 
So when I was going into this, and a lot of the food guys, we actually have a guy out in Polish farms. I think it's Polish heirloom farms now out in Missouri who does a combination of poop and our stuff. Oh, get out of here. Yeah, no. And he, dude, I, dude, that's, I, that's a good combo. Yeah, no. And I was like, I was talking with him and he's like, dude, the combo just like took my stuff to a whole next level. He's like, that's like crazy. I started using poop. I started using the poop and it was good. I started using your stuff. See, like side by side, it was good. And then I put them together. And I'm telling you what, his grow just completely changed. It looks like a jungle now. That I'm actually nuts. really, really impressed. That is wild. The, the, the organic process is really funny. And you kind of touched on it earlier, how it, organic has kind of become a big marketing thing. Yeah. You know? And so there's a couple of different, there's, there's a produce version, like the, the plants you eat, organic certification. And then there's, you know, the fertilizers and pesticide organic certification. Oh, sure. Yeah. So everything different is my understanding. Like exactly. ev- everything. Yeah. And so organic, is, you got to look at it in what context. If you look at it like I'm going to the store to buy organic produce, it's mainly to tell you that harmful chemicals weren't sprayed on there. Right. Glyphosate Roundup wasn't sprayed on there. So you know you're eating, quote, safe produce. Now, when it comes to fertilizers itself, we have a whole different metric that we use. And it really, and it, it, it's, it's a stringent process. You get inspected, they come to your facility. Mostly why we haven't actually got the certification yet is I'm trying to register my products in all 50 states first while this passes because it, it takes so so long to get the certification and it takes a whole bunch of money. So they start off with looking at all of your suppliers. Are, are all your suppliers already certified? Yeah, I guess and they if, have to do that. If, that makes sense. And Yeah, exactly. And they want to make sure you're not used to sneaking in any nitrates or sneaking in anything. So they, they vet all your suppliers, make sure they have their certification. Then there's a process validation that you have to give them. You have to tell them how you manufacture your materials and what goes into it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they come through and they look at, you know, they look at your racks and how you process. Like, are you using the same grinder, the same mill to mill your inorganic materials and your organic materials? Because if so, you violate the certification. And when you're, when they're sitting on your pallet rack, are, are your inorganic things on top of your organic things because debris can fall down onto your organic things and now they're no longer just organic material. Mm-hmm. So you have to have different machines or at least a clean down procedure to make sure you're not cross contaminating things. So it's a very, it's a really laborious process and it's a very pants down as in like they want to know everybody you're talking to, everybody you're working with. So it's, it's a rather laborious process to get things organic certified. It's, it's kind of a pain in the butt. Would you say that, um, <laughs> would you say that most of those, I mean, everything you just listed seemed pretty sensible to me. Yeah, totally. So it's just, it's just comprehensive. It's not overly stringent. It's just comprehensive. And then I imagine also expensive, right? What do they want? Like six figures per fucking product? No, it's not that bad. I think start to end, it's like five or $10,000 product. Oh, really? That's, I mean, that's still nothing to sneeze at, but I thought that no, it was much no. higher than that. No, it's, it's nothing crazy like that. I mean, it's, and it's over a, a prolonged period too. So it's like, you'll pay that over a year essentially. And then you have to renew every year. And you yeah. know, if you do any modification to your recipes, you have to let them know. They have to read that material suppliers. Oh so man. A, so one thing oh, changes yeah. and it brings down the whole house of cards. Yeah. That's, that's really tough. I know. And so we, that's why when we, when we make these formulations, like it takes me two or three years to dial in a formulation. Because I want to make sure everything is particular and I get positive plant responses. I get functionality within our irrigation equipment. That's the main reason why I made this organic fertilizer line the way I did. Because I got tired of having all these irrigation systems that couldn't fit all these products, organic products that couldn't fit our irrigation. Yeah. So me coming from conventional agriculture and learning how uh, how pivot irrigation works and, and thousands of acres of drip irrigation works and... You know, all these fertigation systems and top down sprayers and aerial spraying and all these different metrics to it. I wanted to set out and and make an organic product that can be utilized inside drip systems. It can go through pivot irrigation. That can be aerial sprayed if they wanted it to. You know, so hundred percent. And that's the main and we talk to people at like their large facilities where they have fertigation systems. The number one reason why they don't do organics is is because it doesn't work in their system. Yeah. Sure. So that's my whole thing is setting out, making sure they had um, powder based products that they could make into a, into a stock tank, and make it push, push out through fertigation system. Very, very cool, man. 
yeah, so I can kind of help these big commercial facilities have better quality and have at least, you know, organic products being created. So, yeah. And it's just, it just kind of, um, I I don't know what the word is. Fascinates me, I guess. It's just weird how a lot of companies already follow the guidelines, right? This is something that happens in coffee all the time. Right. You got the, they got the guy who gets the organic certification, but then as soon as the inspector leaves, he goes and does his thing. And then you got the other side of the coin, which is the guy who's doing it organically, but he can't afford, let's put organic aside. He's doing it rainforest friendly, but he can't afford the rainforest friendly certification because it's expensive. Right. It's a lot of yep. freaking money and, and, uh, and there's a small oh, pro- yeah. profit margin in coffee. So that appears to be the same thing with your line, which is all your ingredients are organic, but you just don't have the, uh, the authorization yet to stamp organic on the bottle. Exactly. I think there are several nutrient companies in that position, which is just weird. It's a strange thing. Yeah. It takes, it takes time and it takes a lot of um, inspection and a lot of like thorough vetting, which, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally down for And we're, we're making moves down in, um, We'll be in Canada and Europe this year, and then we're working on a on a contract down in Panama because they just went medical down there. Oh, that's you know, awesome! Legal. They 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 legalize in some way down there. Um, so we're working with a bunch of people and getting down there, and you know, having it eco certified and eco cert over in Europe, which is their organic certification, and then take our organic certification down to Latin America because they don't. I mean, that they're still using TVA fertilizers down there. The Tennessee Valley Authority. It's, it's, salts that are rolled into a little ball that release in 30 days. Jeez. You know, we, we made this back in the seventies and that's what their current technology is. So we're really trying hard to get all this organic goods down there because they grow 66% of the world's food. Like if I'm really trying to make an impact and make sure everybody's having like good nutritionally sound food, like that's, that's where I want to go. I love it, man. Yeah. That that is so cool. And that, you know, that, that definitely flips my cookie because South America, you got coffee and you got cannabis, baby. Yeah. That's what I'm all about. So I love learning exactly. about it. But you know, it's kind of a two pronged approach. You mentioned earlier with the UN stuff, it's about convincing kind of the people at the top that that, that hey, there there are some things we need to consider here. Microbiology needs to be considered here. Soil health needs to yep. be considered. Here. Con- convincing people at the top, which unfortunately I think is more prevalent overseas. I think you said like Europe and Japan. I noticed you didn't mention America. Um, <laughs> but anyways, you know, it, it's the people at the top, and then it's the farmers. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, working internationally is one thing. Um, our, our distribution arm was down in Florida. And so I worked a lot very closely at the Florida farmers for a little bit. And a lot, a lot, a lot of people are stuck in their ways. And I understand that because once you know a way to do it, you don't want to mess it up because that's your, that's your family's revenue. You know, that's your, that's your income. Mm-hmm. You don't want to do anything experimental because you could mess up your income. But the other side of that is like, because we're destroying our farmland through not putting carbon back into it and not having and uh, not supporting our ecosystem around these plants and in the soil, we have to use twice the amount of, of chemicals to grow the plants now. Well, before we could use like 50 to 100 pounds of nitrogen for corn, we have to use 200 to 300 pounds of nitrogen for corn per acre. And every year we have to use more and more and more because right. we don't have the carbon complex inside the soil to to retain so my job mostly has been how do we rejuvenate the land itself and carbon 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 get rid of the synthetic pesticides get rid of the roundups and then start hammering it with carbon and build it over time wow uh, well that's the well that's the united nations they, they were doing a study on on land and one centimeter of soil to be created takes a thousand years for earth naturally to create it Jeez. we can destroy one centimeter of soil in 10 years. That is insane. So you're man. looking at a, a depreciation value of a hundred times what an earth can naturally do. Right. Right. What do you do when you come to a field that's been desolated? I mean, I know you say carbon car, I'm sure you start applying humic acids, but like, what is the whole protocol? Oh, yeah. Are you using enzymes? Are you using, are you adding beneficial bacteria? Well, first you have to make sure the land isn't contaminated with chemicals. I mean, and I mean, by chemicals, I mean, pesticides and, and Roundup. And if that does happen, you know, you need to have alleviation mechanism in place to remediate. So carbon is an amazing substance where if it's full of nitrates. You can put carbon down, like uh, car- uh, carboxylic acid down. It'll bind to the elements in the soil and then de- and as it dries, it'll gas off all the nitrates. So there are certain things you can use to remediate some of these chemicals in there. So you really just have to understand what's in Sadly, glyphosate is really hard. Some microbes are willing or able to break Roundup down, but Roundup is a descaling agent. Like that, it was used Jesus. in in the oil fields 
in the very beginning. Like, that's what it's created for. When the, they're pumping out the sludge of oil, the crude, and it's going through these tubes and all of like the iron and all of this calcium is starting to bind up to the, to the, the pipe itself. You know, they put Roundup through it, glyphosate to descale, to cling to all of these elements and then to put, to pump them out, you know, so they can clear out the tube. Holy fuck. Well, we use that for, for, for all of our, the weeds around our crops. You know, we eat Roundup because it gets sprayed on the plants and there's Roundup ready plants. And it goes into our gut and locks us out from all of our, all of our nutrients. So we just excrete it. We, we pee and poop it out, you know? Jesus Christ, man. That glyphosate ended up being really, and you know, that the, what pisses me off is they were pushing back against the anti-glyphosate. They always do that. Man. Oh yeah. If you want to talk about yeah. nefarious forces, those are the ones it's, it's, it's all driven by profit yeah. and they don't want lawsuits yeah. and it didn't work out this time. Cause what ended up happening? One of the largest lawsuits uh in in agricultural history with that glyphosate lawsuit yep so and it's really cool because the, the, the lawyer is really smart they didn't go after glyphosate as causing the cancer they went after the inactive ingredients in roundup that causes the cancer and went around them right that's my understanding too it is, isn't it something to do with the creation how it's created it makes those compounds that are fucking really bad for you <laughs> yep exactly and then it goes <laughs> in there and it descales our whole body and that's why our immunity system get sick that's why all autoimmune diseases went up two thousand percent in 1994 you're speaking to my language here man you're you know. speaking my language it's the war on the microbiome i cover it on my other podcast it's, pretty heavily yep. but then i come and back over saying. here and i realize that it all starts in the soil yep and it's, it's funny like they talked about in the beginning we're like is it delicious is it not and i you know i i like to choose the idea that it's not necessarily malicious. We're just humans are naturally greedy. And when it comes to profit yeah. and things being the way they have been, no one likes change. And yeah. when it's profit driven in a capitalistic market, they're going to do everything they can to keep making their money, regardless of the impact it has on human health. Exactly. When you, when you put profit and market domination above, if those are your top two values above things yeah. like your own race, for instance, or the future of the planet, Right. You know, humanity itself, that sort of thing. That's when you start to see that type of thing. And you're right. It doesn't even there doesn't even have to be some cabal. It's just this guy cuts the checks. Right. If this guy cuts the checks, you're going to keep him happy. Yes. Every time you write him an email, you're going to be, hey, how's it going, man? I mean, it's just it's just, exactly. how, it's just how it works. So, yeah. And that's why everybody needs to vote with their dollars. Yes. Like by, by you buying these these chemicals by you by you spraying down a minute cloaker you're supporting or buying right up and spraying it you're supporting Bayer. you're supporting these people that don't give a crap yep. about our land or the future they only care about the profits right now so that's why it's so important that we all vote with our dollars and put it into companies that actually want to do good and promote health in the world you know because this is not percent. our future this is our kids future this is our kids kids future and this is really what spikes uh, sparks me to to go into agriculture because uh, to make to make a difference in this world because I want my kids to be able to live happy and healthy, you know, and not have glyphosate on their GD cereal. Yeah, well, I don't I know why I censored say. myself there. I'm like goddamn <laughs> cereal. Um, I guess yeah, I was, yeah, <laughs> um, totally. And so it comes down to to you know making sure what we put into the earth is like what we're putting into our body. Something healthy that's going to help support their, our own body's ecosystem with our microflora. The same thing has to be done with with all the, the the farmland and even our indoor pots that we throw away our, our cocoa or we throw away rock wool and things into the environment, you know, we all just need to be conscious about it. And if, and if we're all more conscious about, you know, not having nitrate and phosphate runoff, so we have all these algae blooms throughout the intercoastal in Florida or throughout all these rivers, I, I think that's the only really when we can start making a, a change is when we get the, the hundredth monkey effect to happen where we all realize we need to take part in this. Man, I couldn't you know? agree more. Very, very well said. Let's give out some plugs. I'm sure I'll have a couple more thoughts before we wrap it up, but really quickly, culturedbiologics.com. That's where you can find them. Cultured Biologics with an I-X at the end there. Biologics. And you're on uh, Instagram as well, are you not? Yep. No, we're on Instagram. Uh, C-U-L dot T-U-R dot E-D. Oh, yeah. Cultured. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> oh, the cleverest thing I could come up with. <laughs> it is, it's cool, man. Yeah. Well, give them a follow, everybody. Yeah, we're about 50 followers away from 7,000. We used to do a thousand follower giveaway every thousand. So if you guys want to, you know, have a chance to win some of our new fertilizer technology, you know, feel free to come on, follow us and, and take part in the giveaway and be happy to send you guys some stuff. Oh, I love it, man. We love giveaways. So go and get in on it, everybody. Get some of that cultured biologics. What yep. is, um, let me ask you this before we wrap it up. 
What's the future for the company? And more importantly, beyond that, what are you currently just now kind of learning about immersed in and scratching the surface of in your own research? So yeah, no, future of culture biologics. I mean, we're, we're just now starting to release our, our technology for nutrients. We have a very unique way of doing things. You're going to see us come out with granulars and liquid carbon-based fertilizers and, and a whole assortment of things. I want to give a toolbox, a one-stop toolbox for every need an organic farmer would have. And so, you know, a, a lot of this is, this is, this, this blows my mind. I, I, I fascinate, I get fascinated with this so much about carbon and the way it plays inside of the plant. And it, it's just the technology and where we're at right now. What, what really, really like has like floored me the past five years starting cultures is our technology now is far more advanced than ever before. I mean, you talk about like, or, like farmers having to like, till in soybeans into their soil that they give the plant to give the soil a nitrogen profile. I mean, till in hay, the till in all these old manures and the old ways of doing things, you know, and now we have technology where we can strip all the nitrogen out of a soybean and have just a pure <laughs> protein based nitrogen. You were able to take essential oils and isolate the terpenes out of them and then concentrate the terpenes like 15, 20%. So they're actually effective at killing insects without having to spray neurotoxins like it just it, it's truly fascinating to me that our technology is at a point where it never has been before so we can take all of these organic practices all these old ancient ways to do it and actually put it into a modern form that can compete with conventional agriculture it's, it's fascinating i gotta dig into that man so first of all the soybean derived aminos uh -huh. this seems to be very popular you know the knf guys love it they, they love their soybean amino stuff. What oh, is yeah. it about soybeans? What, why is it just they're cheap and they're packed full of them? Like, are they the, just the best source we have? They're one of the best sources, one of the largest sources of nitrogen we find in plants. They have one of the largest varieties of amino acids that we can isolate from a plant. And lastly, they're abundant. So you look at, our, they're, they're, you look at the top five crops we grow throughout the United States, and really throughout the world, soybeans are on them. They're all over me here in Illinois. Everything is a soybean farm or a corn farm. Exactly. So as far as byproducts go, and as far as being able to utilize it as a commodity, it's one of the more readily available ones. So what you just have to worry about, and this is where I, I kind of took my time to source out the proper ones, you need to find non-GMO soybeans, and you need to find uh, soybeans that are, are some type of organic certification. On what was you that first that thing you, don't you have said? Any non-GMO. Non oh, non-GMO and organic certified is what you look for. Yep. So all of our soybeans come from Spain. Oddly enough, and so they're they have they're non-GMO and they don't have any chemicals sprayed in them. So I know that the the nutrition I derive from that is in a form that you know is it, it's clean and potent. And you know when it comes to soybean amino, I can talk at length about this. But when it comes to Please. soybean amino acids, really just any any amino acids. Look at look at the water soluble nitrogen and look at the water insoluble nitrogen. The more insoluble nitrogen in there, the more, uh, or the, the, it's not as broken down as like a full water soluble nitrogen. So our, our, uh, nitrogen source from soybeans is 17%. Hmm. Only 0.25% of that is water insoluble nitrogen. Right. So 99.75% of all of the nitrogen is 100% available because proteins you have to break down through enzymes, right? And a lot of these China soybeans or the amino acids that are coming through, they're just not completely broken down. So it takes time. So you don't have access to that nitrogen. So it might say 14% nitrogen, but 3% of that nitrogen is insoluble. So you have to wait for that other 3% to fully come available. Whereas ours is probably the most refined soybean nitrogen product in the market right now. And so we can put 10, 20 pounds of this soybean amino acids into a gallon of water and have it stay suspended like it won't ever fall out so you know not all soybean amino acids are created equal so definitely do your due diligence do your research on them but there are some really really cool versions of them out now i can understand the organic certification if you're doing a ferment or anything like that i'm sure you don't want the pesticides but why non-gmo yeah. what does that mean to you as far as the end product so a lot of these gmo soybeans are roundup ready so, which means like you can plant these genetically modified soybeans and just cover the entire field with Roundup 
and it won't kill the soybeans at all, but it'll kill all the weeds around it. <laughs> Can you imagine that's your solution to weeds? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> it, dude, seriously, it's, it's amazing. They're also the Terminator seeds. I heard. I heard this is coming to cannabis. Yep. yep. Oh, yeah. They're going to try to plug it everywhere they can. They're going to do genetically modified cannabis. So you can have pink, purple, red, yellow, whatever color you want. They're going to genetically crisper it to genetically modify it to have those colors and to be a terminator. So you always have to keep going back. But again, it's, I don't think it's malicious. I think it's really derived from them ensuring that they can always make money. Yeah, totally. So you can't just fucking have, that's the beauty of a plant. The inherent beauty of a plant is the ability to pollinate, breed, yeah. take a cutting. All of those things are what makes it beautiful. And they want to rob that in the name of profit. So the, so the terminator genes, um, I think I've brought up once before on this show and, and it was brought up in membership. Malachi Kevin talking about Mon Satan, as he puts it. Uh, basically, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This is altered so that the pollen that it produces it sterilizes anything it touches. You can't breed with it. You can't make more seeds. Anything that it touches can it can sterilize too. Is that accurate or no? Yeah, um, you think about it, and the pollen that it releases goes up into the the jet stream, and it falls on another plant that is a similar variety. Just like cannabis, like you can have hemp pollinate high CBD hemp pollinate high THC cannabis yeah, right yeah. so same thing with like you know your other beans and your other corn things like that and it gets mixed into that gene pool and then you know it's always going to be a percentage of that compared to the, the host dna so over time though you're going to work it where instead of that terminator dna getting laced into five percent or 6.75 percent of the total gene pool you're going to see over time it's going to get worse and worse and worse and completely contaminate all of our all of our seeds like we, we know not what we do type of thing where we Jesus. think it's a great idea but really if you look at what it's going to end up doing in the long term it's going to really mess some things up i mean you look at wheat they made genetically modified wheat able to be sold from like 2003 or 2000 to 2003 or something like that in the early 2000s and they stopped it and still now today 15 years later it's almost 20 years later they're still finding genetically modified dna in our wheat even though they're not allowed to sell it anymore for the past 15 years. Jesus. And it's like, how do we reverse something that is so catastrophic to our gene pool where we're the literal at the, at the end of the day, generations from now, the only seeds we're going to be able to have is what they sell us because they've already contaminated our entire, not, not to be apocalyptic or anything, but it's really <laughs> going to mess up our food supply. You know, that is a possible future. I don't know how we hold these people accountable for the risks that they're taking. Again, back to Molokai, Kevin, when I say Molokai, Molokai is a deserted island, essentially, in Hawaii. It's the small, it's the mm -hmm. least populated, populated Hawaiian island. And uh, it's a sleepy little, you know, barely any people there island. Well, Monsanto is there on the island and they do all sorts of crazy shit on that island. The locals don't want them there. They burned down the headquarters multiple times. They rebuild it every time. Yeah. And they do this testing. And, you know, I, I asked Molokai, Kevin, I said, why here? Why on Molokai? And he goes, again, this, this kind of points to that maliciousness. He goes, they want to make sure that if something fucking goes wrong, like really wrong, that they can contain it. That's why they always do testing yes. in these uh, remote places or an island, secured, quarantined places. It's so if they fuck, they know that they're playing with fire. And if they fuck something up, they'll at least have it contained. Isn't that an indicator that maybe we shouldn't be doing it? <laughs> you know what I yep. mean? Yeah. No, they are. Uh you had, you know, invasive species come around every once in a while. And um, there was an invasive slug, I think, in Hawaii. So they released a predatory slug, the rosy wolf slug, over there. And the rosy wolf slug started consuming all the other snails and slugs on the island, except <laughs> for the one they released it for. And it's like, when you start playing around with these things, you really start to impact it's like a um you heard have you read The Sound of Thunder? No. Or or saw the movie. It's like they have this like program where you go I'm, I'm a big sci fi nerd. They go back in time into the future. They go back in time to the dinosaurs and they're on like this hovering path and they can't step off. Well one time one person stepped off and stepped on a butterfly and they went back to the future and then the future was completely destroyed by jungles and, and right. predatory animals that are meant to kill humans and things like it just it's a, it's like a, it's a criticism based on when we interact with just one thing in nature, we don't know the effect, the ripple effect it's going to have down the road from now. 
Exactly. You know? It's it's the knock on effect combined with the ripple effect, and it gets really scary when you apply it to nature. You're 100 yeah, percent right. Absolutely. And and that's where it comes down to like we really do need all these brilliant minds in the world figuring about figuring out how we can preserve our future through agriculture because what we've been convinced to do agriculture in the past 60, 70 years is not sustainable by any means. And so we really need people to be open minded and understand that like we still evolve every single day with our technology and we have to be able to evolve the way we do, we, we farm to be beneficial, not just, not just try to feed the world like we need to do, but also support the health of our world. You know, I couldn't agree more, man. Do you really do vibe with the values of, of this show? And it, this was an excellent interview. We're actually past our, uh, <laughs> our allotted time. I don't mean to keep you late here, Tim, oh, seriously, no, no, man, can you come back on sometime? Like this was a fantastic interview. Anytime you let me know, I'll be more than happy to come on talk and, and talk shop with you. So cool, man. So cool. Everybody go give them a follow. Find uh, culturedbiologics.com. Find them on Instagram. And uh, yeah, Cultured Biologics. This is a good link up here. Uh, that's all, everybody. This is Tim and Jordan signing off, saying be safe out there, every one of you, and grow smarter. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. That's our show. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I do appreciate it. Of course, a reminder, OKC, the Oklahoma City meetup this Friday, the 21st, 4.20 p.m. to 7.20 p.m. at Gayate's Restaurant on 23rd Street. Gayate's, G-U-Y-U-T-E-S. Come on down. Come say hi. I'd love to hang out, smoke some with you, trade some seats. 4.20 p.m., 7.20 p.m. this Friday, the 21st, OKC. Before we wrap it up, AC Infinity. I'm going to see them soon, everybody. I'm going to go down to AC Infinity headquarters. Go to acinfinity.com. Use code GROWCAST15 for 15% off site-wide. Not nearly site-wide. And their Cloud Ray fans should be dropping soon. They might be out at the time of this recording. I don't know, folks. I'm just recording this ahead of time. They said early 2022, those Cloud Rays are dropping. You're going to want to grab these. I have one. They're the next level in oscillating fans. I'm surprised no one's made an oscillating fan that actually makes you happy, that actually does what you want it to do. And this is it, folks. The cloud rays are out of control. I got sent a developer's tester model. They are perfect. Uh, 10 speed fan controller. They clip right onto your tent pole. They're super, super adjustable, easy to adjust angle, easy to adjust height. The cloud rays are the next level of oscillating fan, and they are dropping soon. Code GROWCAST15. But of course, get your inline fans, get your tents, get your fabric pots, scissors, everything you need at AC Infinity. And use code GROWCAST15. Always send us every code you use. If you want to email us or DM us um, on Instagram or Discord, however you can get it to us, send us when you use a code. You're entered to win free seats every single month. Uh, do appreciate those submitting their codes. I see them come through. Even if I don't respond, you're, you're entered. You send it, you're entered to win. You might just be the winner this month. Some free seats. Oh, what else do we got? Like I said, uh, February, I'm down in SoCal. I'll be doing an Oceanside meetup. Make sure you're on the green list for that to see all our action, including joining the green list, growcastpodcast.com slash action. Like I said, I'll be down there uh, in SoCal February. I'll be visiting AC Infinity. We'll do that Oceanside meetup. That's a big one. And then the Cultivators Cup, April 23rd. That's down in Southern Illinois at the Hideaway. That's the submission date slash party for the Cultivators Cup. There's going to be legal indoor consumption. There's going to be food. There's going to be fun. There's going to be music, some pressing, live pressing going on. It's going to be a blast. Cultivators Cup 423. Stay tuned for more info on that, everybody. Coming very shortly. All right. That's all, everyone. I know you enjoyed this episode, so stay tuned for more. We got Queen of the Sun coming on. We got Duke Diamond coming on. A whole bunch of stuff coming at you. I know you'll enjoy it. Thank you for staying subscribed. Best of luck in your gardens. Bye-bye, everyone.